Hey there, entrepreneurs. My name is Sushant and welcome to Trep Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives and thought leaders, and ask them questions about their business story, and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start to grow their businesses. And today I'm really excited to welcome Leonid Kodor to the show. Leonid yes. is an engineer and inventor of Upcart. Upcart is a three-wheeled foldable cart which makes it possible for a cart to walk up the stair. Upcart came to market in 2015 at the National Hardware Show in Las Vegas to instant success. The Upcart has won multiple awards, including the most innovative concept award from the National Inventors Association of America, as well as Retailer's Choice Award four times by the North American Hardware and Paint Association. And today I'm going to ask Leonid a few questions about his entrepreneurial journey and some of the ways he has started and grow, grown his business. So Leonid, thank you so much for joining me today at Trip Talks. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. So I know we were just chatting a little bit about your background and you said that you consider yourself uh, an engineer first and foremost. Yes. So can you share a little bit about, you know, you know, even before you created this product called Upcart, you know, you were already an engineer. You you had a, you know, full background. You you had already patented quite a different products. Can you share a little bit about what you were doing before creating uh, creating Upcart, and how did you get the idea for creating this uh, this product? Uh, before we um, we came to US when I was, I believe, 42 years old. And uh, at that time, I already had uh, more than 20 inventions patented in the USSR. And uh, I work with diverse, very diverse field of, uh, of machinery. From uh, food preparation machinery for, for, uh, for commercial, uh, enterprises to uh, vending machines, uh, packaging machinery for, for uh, food uh, food bases, so store, stores of food. Uh, and so some, uh, some packaging machinery for, for medicine and uh, 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 semiconductors and so on and so on. So uh, in, uh, in the US when we came, I initially uh, found work in uh, special uh, machinery, which is uh, basically production machinery for certain things, uh, like uh, uh, lighting bulbs in, in G. Uh, and later I become patent agent. I help uh, with, with uh, the execution of patents to, to inventors. And uh, besides that, I work on uh, some things that uh, I got patented, patented as well. Not, not everything, of course. Not everything makes economic sense to, to go to patent, especially with special machinery. But uh, some things, and um, now it's about 35 or, or more patents, I don't know. Uh, well, that's kind of the ground. My wife is an electrical engineer, so we, we kind of a team. And she was much better than me in management. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, the, the upcard uh, came uh, kind of unexpectedly from from, uh, from my granddaughter at the time, five years old. Her, uh, her trust in me, her belief in me that I can do anything, and uh, some previous knowledge that uh, what, what devices could be used to, to go over uh, a rough ground, uh, including steps or carbs or whatever. 
and uh, uh, that, that was done. My my part is it, uh, in it was to uh, to devise the way to make it disappear, because if it's not folded, it takes too much space for for average citizen to, to have this device. It takes too much space in apartment or, or even small house. So, uh, and uh, people uh, mistakenly think that uh, my invention in that is three wheel cup. No way. It was known probably before I came to this world, mm. but uh, nobody thought about how to how to fold those wheels so they would flat against the frame. Mm. And it's not it's not actually uh, that difficult. It's an engineering uh, problem problem that uh, when you think about it, it it's kind of uh, asking for to be solved a very simple way. So uh, that, that's entire invention, just to put axle of rotation of the uh, wheels arm, the way that arms would fold uh, 90 degrees or about 90 degrees visually, because in reality, they, they move uh, about 120 degrees, but mm -hmm. you see it as 90 degrees. Okay. So that, that's... Uh, that's an all invention. After that, it just worked and uh, um, and uh, kind of with customers' help to find a better way to, to do this. Okay. But I think in the second generation, or it's a third generation of, of uh, the device with different concept of uh, folding, but, but uh, different folding mechanism, but the same uh, the same idea how to fold. Okay. When you started or when you created this, uh, this product or the, you know, the folding invention of it, right? The folding innovation of it. Did you think at that time that this, did you have a commercial aspect of it in mind like did you think that this this would become a product that could be sold uh in a mass market commercially or was it really just about that you were trying to solve a problem for yourself and you thought maybe this will help some other people also no i i clearly understood commercial value or whatever of, of the product because uh, basically, everyone at some point uh, in life would need it. Uh, people who uh, uh, who, who uh, invalid in some way, physically or, or uh, age-wise or, or uh, health-wise, and they need uh, they need this to be uh, independent to be able to do things that, that they uh, would not be able to do in another way. It's difficult for, for people to, to move uh, three or four boxes at once or, or on the stairs, or even uh, if you don't have the uh, ramp to go, you need to go over the steps and, and uh, that's a problem for, for for, for people, they they need to uh, use more force than, than uh, that uh, weight uh, of, of the uh, load that they carry to go on steps. So I clearly uh, knew that it would be a thing that, that people need, and that was kind of the, the basis for for doing it. Okay. Um... Are there products in the market available, similar products, that have the three-wheeled mechanism to solve the problem of, you know, bringing this cart up the stairs or, you know, something like that, but they don't have the, the specific invention that your product has? And what is the, uh, you know, 
do you know from like a business sense um from a pricing perspective is there you know how how does this product compete with kind of like the generic model where there is no sort of a folding mechanism do you have any insight on that uh there are there are where and are the cars um, that, that uh, are not folding but those are mostly in the um, industrial shops and uh, uh, they're heavy so they uh, have different devices to let them go uh, over the stairs and they are uh, not really uh, for that because when you go up or down the stairs, you carry along with the load the cart itself, which is a totally different story from go on the even level floor. Because on a level floor, you deal only with a resistance of the friction and inertia. With uh, going over the stairs, you deal with uh, with the weight of the load, and in there, especially when you go down, inertia of going down. It's in addition to friction. Friction is very small uh, part of it. So uh, what you see around in folding carts, <laughs> that was explosion of the market in 2012. And after that, when uh, a lot of people in China and later everywhere realized uh, a potential of uh, a three-wheel hub or, or folding, it uh, creates uh, value for for, uh, for everyday people. They they could I could make disappear this uh, big device. Mm. Uh, so we have, we have got a lot of uh, people who try to to copy one way or another, but uh, I don't say I wouldn't say that we have real competition because nobody but us can uh, fold it flat. Okay. Now you mentioned that you know, of course, uh, one part of your life or early part of your life you spent as an engineer in USSR. Yes. And then and then you came to the US. Um, I'm very, very curious to know what was it like being an engineer in uh, in USSR and how was how is it different now in the US? Did you like from an engineer's perspective, did you um, did you feel anything different in terms of you know working in the US versus USSR? I would not say that I know um, kind of <clears throat> engineering community. I think that there are some brilliant engineers who can deal with uh, uh, different uh, spheres with, with of engineering and so on. In the USSR, some of us had much wider knowledge and much broader applications. And uh, in in design of the machinery, I was actually uh, more free with, with uh, solution and uh, how to deal it, with it, uh, comparing to, uh, to US, where uh, people who don't understand engineering uh, give give the uh, kind of uh, formulating the, the the problem and engineers don't uh, don't argue with them they mm -hmm. try to, to do what they told and that uh, consumer every uh, always right it's not it's not proper uh, kind of slogan the proper would be you have to uh, uh, listen very carefully to the needs and uh, uh, kind of wants of the customer. Evaluate it. Explain to the customer why why it is wrong, 
and make the best that customers need. Mm. <laughs> so sorry, it was uh, simpler because uh, uh, we all got that we, we need the machine. We, that machine needs to do that and, and this. And please tell us, is it possible? And if it's possible, how it would sound? What, what would be uh, kind of uh, cost? What would be the solution and, and uh, kind of production capacity? And that's all. So uh, nobody uh, but uh, designer engineer was formulating the problem to be solved. That uh, that uh, technical uh, technical uh, position, technical uh, problem was presented to consumer as the solution. Consumer could uh, could reject it and say, "No, I need something else." Mm -hmm. It's a it's a different story, but. But uh, that was like, uh, okay, if you need something else, you, you need to find different different engineer to do. Mm -hmm. So in this, uh, in this area, it was uh, easier in USSR. And, uh, and engineers uh, had more freedom to operate. In the US, uh, much, much narrow function of engineers. And it probably uh, limits the engineering, not ju just capacities, but their thinking. They don't think outside of their uh, kind of narrow profession. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got uh, um, uh, mechanical engineering uh, education, formal education. It doesn't mean that I don't know electricity or vacuum mm. or uh, uh, dynamics or, or something else. Uh, my uh, area of uh, knowledge, which I can uh, invest in in uh, prob problem to be solved, much wider than formal education, because. Mm. The education of engineer continues entire life. Every every next job educates on something. Yeah. So, you know, going from being an engineer to bringing a product to market, of course, you know, you you need, um, you know, you need you need the business side of things, and there's a you know there's a very common saying here. Uh, in North America now, I think in the in the product community, right? Uh, the saying is, if you build it, they won't come, right? So it's it's not just sufficient to have a really good product. Even if you have a really good product, you still need to find, you know, a way to distribute it in the market. You need you need the right marketing. You need the right channels. Um, you need the right education to the consumer so that they can you know, understand the product and and then create demand for it, right? It doesn't matter like how good the product is. The product could be like the, the most wonderful thing, but if the consumer doesn't understand it or, you know, they don't, you don't have the right distribution and marketing and channels, you know, they would never figure it out. So in your instance with Upcart, you know, so you, you had this product, you created this innovation what were some of the next steps in terms of, for you, you know, you realize that there is going to be, there is a commercial, you know, viability of this item. What did you do next in order to bring this product to the market? In this, we were very lucky because the product sells itself. Uh, it, uh, I, I believe in that uh, at the very beginning. And when I do something like that, I put myself in the shoes of the a user. So I, I designed from, from the from the viewpoint of the user. Uh, but beside that, when we uh, came to the uh, first uh, our national hardware show in 2015, we had just a few samples 
of the product. And uh, uh, we, we created, we, we stopped the show. The people, uh, I, I heard that uh, said to, to one another, did you see this stuff in that room? No, you should, everyone there. Hmm. So that's, that's nice to hear. But, uh, and in that, at that show in 2015, uh, that the product was picked up by uh, QVC. Okay. That, that's what actually uh, gave us the, the push, 15,000 cards ordered by QVC right away. And okay, wow. right away, it meant that I, I need to, uh, to get the production right away. Hmm. So I ended, uh, my wife and I ended uh, kind of running around uh, Las Vegas knowing that uh, at Las Vegas, uh, manager of the uh, Chinese shop where uh, a card should be produced. <laughs> and we, we were looking for them everywhere finally found and I said, you know what? We need to ramp up uh, the production because we, we've got the order, we, we need 10 containers of the product in, in three months. Mm. Less than three months actually. So th th that's uh, how it started. And it's continued pr practically the same way. So the product speaks for itself. Okay. The marketing needs that uh, for, for to, to to save people. Do you know mm -hmm. that such thing is is exist? Okay, or uh, say you know what the QVC sold uh, fifteen thousand cards in, in uh, with the velocity uh, fifteen hundred dollars a minute mm -hmm. and more. Okay, yeah. so that's that's all the marketing it needs. You don't have to uh, say you know what your underwear. Uh, you our uh, com, uh, competition sells white underwear. We can offer you different colors, hmm. <laughs> different pictures. We don't need that because we don't have real competition, which is kind of fortunately for me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, so th did that kind of solve solve the problem for you for not making your own huge investment? So, if when when QVC gave you the order, did they pay up front? So that kind of covered the cost of like manufacturing. Did that help you, or that that's not how it went? <laughs> uh, I put my uh, own fifty thousand dollars at the beginning. Okay. To make those those samples, and uh, additional few thousands to get to the show, and that was it. I had no more money hmm. because of uh, that order from QVC. We were able to to borrow money for for initial production, and after that, it kind of rolled. Okay. Um... So QVC did not pay you up front, like you had to borrow money against the order. Oh, QVC has a kind of terrible, <laughs> terrible conditions. They, they, they pay, uh, if I remember correctly, they pay a certain amount uh, after three months and they pay full amount in 180 days. Mm. <laughs> It's it's kind of you you have to live those three or six months somehow, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a start. And we we sold the tails as well. Uh, okay. Not not that much, maybe uh, three containers in, in because the the uh, the show was in May two thousand fifteen. And uh, the car point uh, on sale of, of the end of the August to be seen. And uh, we had we, we had problem with, with uh, 
uh, was supplied because we, we didn't know uh, what would be uh, distribution of these. And we went, uh, we ordered uh, three containers and we had two containers before uh, before the Christmas. And we said that we are okay, but we, mm. we went completely empty uh, before Christmas. Mm. So it was a problem, lost sales. Okay, yeah. Yeah, That that that's definitely uh, a, a complicated problem, right? It's like when you kind of underestimate the sales and, you know, <laughs> And there's a bigger demand. You always have a problem when you start something. The second time is uh, is somewhat easier, but, but first always uh, always difficult, always mistakes. Nothing without mistakes. So in terms of channels right now, of course, you know when if you launch 2015 now, I think it would be like eighth year or something for this. Um, how has your channels expanded? I know you have a website. Uh, I believe you sell on Amazon. You sell on with retailers, hardware stores, and so forth. Can you share a little bit about you know what the distribution is in terms of which channel does the best versus you know? We uh, kind of we we grew very quickly. We had um, about about three million. In 2016, uh, almost five million in uh, 2017, and uh, uh, seven and a half million 2018. Uh, 19 uh, kind of went uh, lower because uh, there was internal problem in the company, and after that uh, was COVID. And everything went down. Hmm. Uh, Vietnam was closed uh, at that time. I moved from China to Vietnam in at the end of 2016. For for, uh, for at that time, the reason was that uh, the hand truck from China uh, uh, have uh, 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 custom duty. Uh, anti-dumping. So the the custom duty were, were, were terrible. In some in some cases, uh, uh, three times uh, of the cost of the product. So I knew about this, and I would I researched about this, and uh, because I uh, we started with the cart, and the next my product was uh, a can truck. The difference between cart and hand truck that cart has a platform uh, over the ground and support to keep platform over the ground because it's used used outside, so you have to keep load uh, over the, over the ground. The hand truck is has platform on the ground and you can push it under the product, and it's used mostly inside of the warehouses and, and uh, wherever you need. Uh, and if you don't afraid to, to, to get something dirty, you can use uh, hand truck. Uh, so, uh, but hand trucks uh, involved uh, anti-dumping duty and cards not. So when, when I uh, designed a hand truck, I knew I need to, to move somewhere. And I moved to Vietnam. I could argue that my product do, does not involve anti-dumping duty, but it would cost me probably at least a year of time of a time and about hundred thousand dollars in 2016. Let's say it would be two hundred dollars now. Mm -hmm. So uh, we moved to Vietnam, and uh, Vietnam was closed from 2021 to May of this year which created a huge problem for us. Uh, it went down, we, we, we lost a manufacturer, initial manufacturer in Vietnam. On top of that, I uh, redesigned and started 
new line of the product. We had trouble uh, looking for another manufacturer. And uh, basically, we, during the COVID, we, we lost everything, basically. Mm -hmm. Without the product, you, you cannot do anything. Mm -hmm. So now we kind of uh, are starting over and uh, expanding. OK. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, I know you mentioned that you are a patent um, patent engineer or patent engineer. OK. Yes. So you probably know a lot about the process of patenting and so forth. I'm really curious to know your thoughts on when should an entrepreneur that is coming up with a new in kind of innovation or you know new idea should consider patenting versus not consider patenting because some entrepreneurs maybe it's quicker for them to go to market rather than you know get involved in the whole process of getting a patent and so forth and of course the protection that a patent offers sometimes you know copycats and so forth can can work around it right so the investment that goes into creating a patent um what are your thoughts on you know when when should an entrepreneur consider a patent or not and and what happens is there what is the what is the expiration date of a patent like even your product is it that after 20 years the patent is going to run out and then at that time you know anybody can utilize your innovation and and so your product will be just one of many uh theoretically yes uh, practically it looks like that uh, you think that you invent something it's it's not a reason to 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 go for a patent. Patent is very expensive, thing. and uh, European patent twice as expensive as uh, American patent. Uh, so if you consider uh, the product would have wide distribution around the world, uh, you you have to have a lot of money to 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 deal with it. I am lucky in this uh, kind of situation because I'm patent agent. So I, first of all, I can do it myself. Second, I don't uh, spend any money in the United States, uh, just the fee uh, to, to fill the application and, and uh, after that fee to, to, uh, to, to issue the patent, which is uh, altogether about three thousand dollars, and uh, after that, uh, in three and a half, five and a half, and seven and a half. No, three and a half, seven and a half, and eleven and a half years. You have to pay uh, um, fee uh, for continuing the patent. So, uh, but if you pay lawyers to do it, we are talking about. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars patent in the US, um, thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars patent in Europe. Considering uh, all the countries, you need to to have grants after you get the patent, and you have to pay annual fees during the uh, application uh, prosecuted. So. If you don't expect to get that kind of money uh, from distribution of your product, don't go for patent. Uh, does it make sense to to patent a token? Only if your invention uh, basic enough and broad enough to cover the field. I would not go for something that uh, have multiple solutions. Hmm. Because after I show that I can solve this problem, somebody else will find another solution. 
because I, when it's uh, it's in uh, science and engineering everywhere, everybody knows that this problem could not be solved. And after that, you find one one person show that it's solvable, and then that turn uh, it turns mind. When mm. people realize that it's solvable, they found a bunch of ways to to, to do it. Mm. It's a normal thing. So if uh, if you invent something that is broad enough to cover all the possible uh, ways to, to solve it, that would be strong. Uh, my initial patent went through uh, sort of opposition in Europe recently and uh, withstood that uh, challenge. And now it's kind of a strong pattern. But the same practical pattern in China was uh, trunked a little bit because China is a different world and, and, mm. and uh, difficult to argue with uh, uh, examiner who doesn't know what's supposed to know. So it, it's easier to argue with uh, knowledgeable people because it's the same language you use. Doesn't mean Chinese English, it means engineering language. And we, with people with limited knowledge, very difficult to argue, especially if they have uh, certain powers. So that, that's that's another problem. But that's, well, that's a lot. So that's why you have so many copycats from China. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm sure, you know, in China, there's, there's more going on there, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's probably people are, you know, bought and sold, uh, under the table. <laughs> but even, even in China, they don't risk to copy, uh, up card. What they okay. do, they, they, uh, they create something looking like it. Okay. Not not functioning like that. Just mm. it and okay. use it and use the branding and wording to describe it from up front. So again, that's life. So upcart is available in a lot of retail stores, I'm assuming. Can you share a little bit about how what the supply chain and distribution process looks like for you. So this item comes from, you said, from uh, from Vietnam now. And do you do you warehouse it or do you, like, is it shipped directly to retailers? How does that process work? It's, it's all kinds of things. Okay? Uh, the, the company, company is not Upcard. Upcard is a brand. Okay. Um, which uh, again, I uh, I get the uh, trademark up card uh, uh, for, for the product. Our company right now vector up products. So, so, so the company is designing the product. Company works with manufacturer in China or Vietnam to make it, to develop it and make it. Because uh, I, I don't make samples, like you, 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 you see uh, uh, industrial samples or something like that. And it means you don't, you think that that would be the product. No, most of the companies make those samples that looks like product. And after that, they go to manufacture and it's completely changed mm. because of uh, real life is not is not what could be printed on the printer. So mm. I I don't make samples. I make uh, a product using uh, 3D software. So I uh, models uh, I communicate models to manufacturer and work with manufacturer to develop the product from mm. from samples to uh, production which uh, kind of less costly and uh, more uh, 
more effective. Uh, effective. Uh, not everybody can do this. I can do it because of extensive experience in uh, not just in designing, but in all kinds of manufacturing. So that, that's, that's a plus. And after that, uh, we, we've got the product to, to our warehouse for retail uh, distribution through Amazon or through our website, uh, through some other uh, venues. And at the same time, we work with uh, different retailers as a wholesaler. So, uh, and those are conditions uh, vary greatly. In, uh, in Japan, uh, South Korea, Europe, uh, it goes like uh, we order the product and it goes in the, uh, 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 our customer pays for a container to, to be delivered and uh, pays for, for the product. So we, we just kind of intermediate uh, a link in this chain, not, not intermediate we, because it's our product. We, we design it, we build it, even with uh, Chinese or Vietnamese hands. Mm. We, uh, they could not make it well without us. Uh, but but that, uh, those uh, last steps from the manufacturer to the distribution, uh, our international partners get product uh, with cont in containers quantities. Uh, and uh, again, there are certain conditions uh, uh, how many wool could be defective? What would be arrangement if we have some de defective product and so on? In uh, in United States, it's a little bit different. To, to, to some customers, we need to, to deliver the containers or less than full container load. So it goes to our warehouse and uh, we for form the load and, and send to customers. So that's all, all kinds. You you can uh, list all kinds of uh, uh, ways for, from product to get from manufacturer to retail, and uh, I'm sure that we use all of them. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um... So in every entrepreneur's journey, there's always mistakes made, lessons learned, you know, during the business building process. Um, what have been some of your big lessons, you know, as as an inventor, as a someone bringing their idea to to the market, and what can other entrepreneurs learn from your your mistakes or lessons? I don't know what they can learn. And the question is, uh, how big of the list <laughs> of the uh, kind of uh, mistakes and problems they had, starting with uh, the, the production. Let's say, initially, I didn't have the experience to work with uh, Chinese manufacturer, Vietnamese mm -hmm. manufacturer. So when they said that, no, we, we cannot do this. I, I tried to accommodate the, their wants and change the product and so on and so on. And after, after the certain uh, time and, and dealing with them, and it was painful. It, it was half an, a year to, to get the contract with them. And after the after contract was signed, they started to try to change the product again. Hmm. So uh, we, we started to, to produce it. And, and uh, in a half a year, I came back and said, okay, guys, I've got enough of, of that. E e e even either you do what I say, or I kind of take my toys and go somewhere. Mm -hmm. That worked. <laughs> uh, but those are technical things, not, not uh, it's a, it's a business as well, but, but uh, it's not 
it's not that uh, every entrepreneur would, would would deal with that or deal with that uh, uh, himself or herself. They, they would have uh, experts in the field to, to deal with that. Um, all, all, all kinds of the problems that, that uh, uh, every business has. Or, or let me put this way, because we have a full line from the concept to retail, we encounter all the, pro all the problems from uh, concept of the retail. Mm. And uh, you can ask uh, uh, a salesman uh, who, who works from wholesale to retail or a retail businessman who, who get the product in, in the warehouse and uh, sees that it's not what he wants and, and all, all these kinds of problems. To, to choose one of them makes no, no, no real sense. Another problem that manufacturer with the time lower the quality. Initially, you, you demand certain things mm. and with the time they, uh, they think that they uh, can make it simpler or better mm. Mm. because they don't know all the function and mm. all the conditions they make simpler they make simpler for themselves. Mm. It's difficult for, for everybody uh, behind them. Mm. So that, that's another problem to deal with, but that's not for, for retail businessmen, not, not, not even for wholesale. It's a problem mm. for, uh, for getting the product. Mm. So, also probably the easiest part of that because you deal with uh, uh, with experts on one side and another side. You yeah. don't deal with, with all the steps that, that involved in uh, in getting the load from uh, Ho Chi Minh City to, to Cleveland. Mm. And, and when you deal with it yourself, you, has, you have uh, at least three companies that involved in transferring this load. You don't work with, with single broker, or you think you 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 deal with single with single broker, but on the way in, you you encounter three people and they three organizations, and they say, "Oh, we don't know about that. Oh, we 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 will uh, ask those guys who." who uh, should transfer product to us, and we, we tell we tell you, and it's uh, it's frustrating because uh, it goes uh, like uh, the best way scenario goes in two weeks from Washington City to California or, or uh, Washington or, or Canada, and after that on rail it goes uh, to Chicago from Chicago to, to Cleveland. And uh, every link on this way kind of uh, goes with, with certain delays. And those delays could be, but you, you can get containers in, in a month or in 50 days. Hmm. That's, that's all, also a problem. So, I don't know. <laughs> do, you, um, do you, I mean, talking about Chinese, manufacturer is it i mean to me it sounds like and i've heard so many stories to me it sounds like it's almost a necessary evil you know businesses go to china because you know they think they can save costs but then they run into so many issues you know there's the language issue there's the culture issue there's the you know uh, regulation issue there is the quality issue and then it's like you're you're trying to you know you want you give them a certain specification and they you know they try to cut corners or they you know it's not the quality that you want. <laughs> um, is it like is that the cost that you pay in order to really cut down the cost of your product? Unfortunately, it it is a necessary evil because. Uh, if I if I uh, 
made this product in the United States, I would not be able to sell it. Mm. I sell it for, for the cost of production in the, in the United States. And that's that's a huge problem and challenge for me. I don't know how to deal with it. It, it would be much higher quality, it would be much better product, but it would cost four times as much as uh, built it in uh, Vietnam. Mm. Um, I, I would gladly build it somewhere closer in Mexico, or, or, or I tried uh, some countries in Europe. It's, it's not possible. Mm. Chinese, uh, China has a certain uh, historical and uh, uh, contemporary inclination to build things. And uh, uh, now we are talking about uh, 30 or 40 years of uh, work in the United States with, with Chinese. So certain knowledge, certain skills were developed. And because of that, China becomes expensive as well. Mm. So the next steps, Vietnam. And mm. uh, work with it. Vietnam, you need to educate them on certain things because they they don't know basically they don't know why they do the things they don't have a uh, formal education to to understand what they are doing sometimes mm -hmm. you look at uh, like uh, uh i don't know monkey with, with uh newest electronic stuff mm -hmm. and not not uh I'm not disparaging what a Vietnamese worker. I'm trying to convey mm. the distance. Mm. So to work with them, you, you need to explain them uh, why they are doing this, to be sure that they would not do it, but they would do it anyway. Mm. It, yeah. So that, that's uh, that a challenge that uh, everybody who, who works uh, there will tell you the same thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So last question. Um, what is what is next for you? How involved are you personally in the business, in running of the business? What do you focus on, on this business? And are you still, are you working on any new products? Are you still honing your engineering craft? Are you coming up with anything new? I'm working on new products. Uh, right now, um, right now we have this new line of products. I'm certainly now involved much more with business um, at the beginning. Because at the beginning I was new P completely, and mm -hmm. I, I I look for for people to to learn from, which was uh, kind of full of mistakes and expensive. Uh, but now I kind of understand enough to to be involved. Strategically, I was involved from the beginning, because again, as well as uh, work with manufacturing to explain them what to do. I need to work with marketers and uh, uh, and sales staff and everybody else to explain them that we have unique product. We don't need to compete on price. We don't need to offer uh, bonuses or, or, or discounts or anything else because we are the entire market. Mm -hmm. The people want cheap stuff free to go and try it, and they would come mm. to us after them. It, it's difficult. Not, not everybody uh, accept it and, and understand it, especially salespeople. They mm. used to work with discounts and, and uh, all this kind of uh, uh, lubricating materials to, to, to get through. Yeah. So uh, that's another challenge. Now I'm more involved with, with uh, marketing and, and uh, somewhat sales after COVID, because we, we had to 
get, get uh, uh, people off. We, we couldn't pay them. Uh, and and we, yeah. let's hope that I would uh, let people have peace of my load um, later. Um, uh, that's uh, all, but, but uh, I work on new product uh, most of the time, I would say. Okay. Final final question. I mean, I know I, I said final question before, but this is the final question. Any last advice, any best advice that you received as an entrepreneur or you would give to other entrepreneurs? What is your best advice? Most best advice, <laughs> if you don't believe in the product, if you don't believe that a product is needed, uh, don't try to, to sell it because uh, you end up with uh, selling it cheap and would not get uh, profit or, or satisfaction from it. So the, the, the best the best salesmen, best ent entrepreneurs, uh, the, the person who believe in their product. Hmm. And the good product is a base of, of marketing. If, if you don't have a somewhat outstanding or unique product, you have to compete on price. You go yeah. down, down, down. For example, when first uh, folding cards uh, become available and it was in uh, end of the 90s, I believe uh, that uh, company in China uh, that I use, they, they prior to that and after that, they, they make this Magna card, the card with, with spoken wheels, single wheels. Uh, they uh, started uh, with, let's say, normal pricing, but because it's not unique. Now, the same way they started, they were new. But next year, there was a bunch of Chinese cards, imitators, and they have nothing to, to contradict those imitators. They, they don't have patents, they don't have uh, trade secrets, nothing. So they started to compete with their imitators by going down. Mm. You can down, you can go down in price to, to certain ways. They got to the point that then when we sell uh, the the card for twenty dollars hmm. for, for one year, one year, and after that they stopped. They they went a little bit up because they they lose money on that. Hmm. But again, you you don't see uh, you don't see those uh, magna cards around because. They uh, sold their business to to bigger uh, car manufacturer because they, they could not compete on price. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. that's that's probably the, the lesson. You you cannot get into the business selling the same stuff that everybody else said. You have to some, yeah. have something that only you can offer. Yeah, that's. I think that's a great advice, and I think. The recently I was talking to someone and, you know, they kind of shared the difference between an entrepreneur versus a business person. And I think that's kind of the, the difference. An entrepreneur basically looks at a problem and, and comes up with a unique solution that's not available in the market. And uh, whereas a business person is kind of creating some sort of a business, which is, you know, which is which is more of a commodity, which is kind of competing with other businesses and so forth. And and I think it's to be said that, you know, when you're creating a new idea or, you know, something, there has to be some sort of a protection, which I think, you know, uh, Warren Buffett calls it a moat. You know, there has to be some sort of a competitive advantage that others cannot quickly copy. There has to be some protection like a patent or something which gives you a little bit of a protection because once you come up with an idea, it's like 
it's very, I, I think it's prone to getting copied or, you know, people coming up with similar ideas and so forth. So. Yeah, you, you, you see it everywhere that uh, when they say something, uh, something unique, it doesn't mean that you have to invent things like, okay, the Burger King is unique and they uh, brand itself unique. But a bunch of other burger uh, shops imitated, not completely, but good enough to, to be competitors. The mm. same with, uh, with McDonald's, the same with uh, uh, every, every restaurant. They, they try to, you, you can go, uh, you can jump ahead for half a year, for two months. And if you create a brand in that time, that you can uh, have, have somehow sell like uh, McDonald's. Hmm. Their, their, uh, their slogan is unique. Okay? The same goes for, for everywhere. You you need to to some kind of turn to 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 sell your product that is different from others. Some yeah. some step that would uh, kind of allure uh, consumer to you. Yeah, yeah, a differentiating factor for sure. Well. Yeah. Well, Leonid, uh, those were all the questions I had. I know we went uh, a little bit over uh, today, but uh, I want to thank you so much again for joining me uh, on the podcast, for sharing your story. Um, definitely a different perspective. You know, um, I think you're the first, first entrepreneur who is a pure engineer, inventor uh, that I've uh, had the opportunity to talk to. So definitely a different perspective and, and uh, a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, thank you so much again for joining me today. And I wish you all the very best in your future invention journey and also business journey. So thank you again for joining me today at Trip Rock. Thank you.